Mercy Me is coming to Pittsburgh. The Together Again Tour with Mercy Me, Crowder, and special guest Andrew Ripp. Thursday, October 5th. Bring your family and friends to the PPG Pain Serena in Pittsburgh for Mercy Me, Crowder, and Andrew Ripp live in concert. Three multiple award-winning artists on one stage for one night. Let your spirit soar, your heart sing, and your faith ignite. Mark your calendars for Thursday, October 5th. Get your tickets now at mercyme.org. It's exciting that the business boutique was made for you. I know that I can make a difference in people's lives, and I want to do that. Hearing a lot of what other people are going through is really healing in a sense and motivating as well. I have the world in my hand, and I can do whatever I want. Learning from some of the top leaders who can make these dreams a reality is just so exciting. It ignited a passion in me to know she can do that, we can do that too. I'm so blessed to have heard the podcast that led me to this moment. Welcome to the Business Boutique Podcast. I'm Christy Wright, and this week we are talking about having a plan for your business. We started talking through this last episode, so if you're a new listener, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to episode one. That way you can get the full business plan that we're outlining here. And then later on in the show, I'll be interviewing Melissa Hennett, who's the founder and owner of Grace and Lace. You'll also hear from Megan Hardwick, who's a real-life success story. She's a woman just like you who had a simple idea that she believed in. She made a plan, and she now runs a growing cosmetics business. But before we get to all that, let's finish talking about the plan. So today we're going to cover Tier 3 and Tier 4 to finish up your business plan. Tier 3 is going to be where you set up shop. This is where you cover the operational side of things for your business. It's really the nuts and bolts of how you're going to operate. And then tier four is the fun stuff. This is where you put yourself out there and we cover everything about marketing, social media, and advertising. So let's talk about tier three. Tier three is where you want to think about the operational side of things. This is where we get technical. And I'll be honest with you, it's not my favorite part, but you know what? It's very important. Tier three is where you have the ability to maximize efficiency in your business. You can put in policies and processes and plans that help you streamline things so that you're faster, things cost less, and as a result, you make more money. And at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do in business. So tier number three, you want to cover everything you need to think about of how you want to operate your business day to day. And we want to get specific here. You want to cover the details. There are a ton of things you can plan for in your business in tier number three, but there are three that I want to focus on today. I want you to think about your logistics, your platform, and your policies. The first thing I want you to think about is, what are the logistics of your business? And by that, I simply mean, how are you going to fulfill orders? Now, this may look a little different if you're in a product-based business or a service-based business, but at the end of the day, you want to fulfill orders or appointments in a way that is very, very efficient. For example, many of the women I've worked with in product-based businesses fulfill orders on demand. While that may seem like a good idea when you're getting started, once you start to grow your business, this can be very inefficient because you're running to the store, you're buying supplies, coming home, trying to make that one order, then running to the post office, and it leads to a very inefficient process. Instead, I want you to think through how you're going to fulfill that order. Maybe you make products twice a week, and every order that comes in before Tuesday or Friday, if those are your days, you make them all at the same time, and it becomes much more efficient. Maybe once or twice a week, you make a run to the post office where you ship all orders that came in up to that point. The bottom line is, whatever your plan is and whatever your schedule is needs to be something that works for you, works for your customer, and it's efficient. If you're in a service-based business, logistics really comes down to you managing your calendar. This is where you fulfill appointments based around your schedule that you set and also the customer's needs. I will give you a piece of advice. I would not schedule your appointments only based around what the customer wants because even though that seems like great customer service, the truth is you're going to be running around like crazy and not be able to have a life outside of work. So instead, plan your schedule. Set blocks of time that you accept appointments within and then schedule your clients within those blocks of time. That way, you're able to knock out multiple appointments in any given day and at the end of that block of time, guess what? You get to be off work. It helps you maximize efficiency in your schedule and maximize the profit that you'll gain as a result. 
The second thing I want you to think about is what platform are you going to use for your business? And by platform, I just mean where will your business live online? Now, this is different than social media. We're not talking about marketing yet. I'm talking about what is the main hub or home for your business and having an online presence. You've got a few options, but let's talk about the three most common. The first one is Etsy. Etsy can be a great site for incubating small businesses. It allows you to get your feet wet, but you don't have a lot of the operational overhead that you have to deal with if you maintain your own website. You can kind of get a feel for things before you branch out on your own. But if you're ready, a full website may be a great option for you as well. You have many more options of how you want things to look and operate on your own website, but keep in mind it can be costly to maintain. Some people also use a blog. A lot of small businesses are driven by content, and so many business owners will connect with their customers through posting articles and tips, or maybe you're a photographer, so you post pictures. But then at the same time, you're able to list your products and services and accept payment and orders on your blog as well. Whichever option you choose, the bottom line is you want to have a platform for your business online that is easy for you to use. Because if it's easy for you to use and you understand it, you're much more likely to be successful versus picking something that's over your head and it becomes a frustrating aspect of your business. The third thing you want to think about in tier number three are what policies you need for your business. We talked a little bit about logistics and fulfillment, but you need to think about what policies do you want to set around those things. For example, if you run a product-based business, you need to think about different situations that might come up. You want to have a refund policy, for example. How will you handle a situation where there's a mistake or something is damaged, or maybe the customer's just unhappy with the product for some reason? You need to have a plan for how you're going to handle that customer and that situation. If you're in a service-based business, you need a plan for cancellations. If you don't have a cancellation policy, you're going to be running around chasing your customers down, trying to track them down when they don't show up for their appointment. The result is you can't manage your schedule and you can't have a life outside of work because you're constantly chasing people down. So what policies do you need to set in your business? Maybe it's a refund policy. Maybe it's a shipping policy during busy seasons around holidays. Maybe it's a cancellation policy. When you think through some of these scenarios that come up, it's going to save you so many headaches of dealing with that situation when it actually happens. I know you want to serve the customer well, and of course, you can always go above and beyond to help that person. But if you have a policy, you can always point back to that on your website and say, here's how we handle these situations. The truth is, at the end of the day, if you just take really good care of people, you probably don't have to worry about policies anyway. Policies, more often than not, are for people that don't know how to act right. They're for people that try to take advantage of you and try to get more for less, and they really protect you and your business in the process. So it's a good idea when you're planning out your business and filling out your business plan to just think through those scenarios so you know how to handle them when they come up. Okay, so that wraps up some of the basics you need to know about tier number three, where you're going to plan the operational side of your business. Now let's talk about the fun stuff. Let's talk about tier number four. This is the marketing. And I'll tell you guys, I have a background and degree in marketing, and so I love talking about this. This is where you put yourself out there. You tell the world, hey, I'm doing this thing. And if you want to have really great marketing in your business, there's really two things that you need to know. You need to know who you are, and you need to know who your customer is. Now, here's what I mean by that. Of course, I'm sure you're thinking, yeah, Christy, I know who I am. But what I mean is, Who are you in terms of your business? Because your business will always reflect you. It will always reflect your personality and your strengths and your weaknesses. So when you start to think about who you are as a person and how that's going to come out in your business, it helps you create branding that's true to you. Now, branding is how you want to represent your business in the marketplace. That's who you are. And branding includes three things, the look, the tone, and the feel of your business. The look would be how your business looks visually. So this would include colors and fonts and graphics and images, things that you choose to represent your business. Your logo would be an example of the look of the branding of your business. Now, the tone is slightly different. The tone is just your word choice. That's what words you use to describe your business. The feel is a little bit different. The feel is more of what the customer experiences when they interact with you. So whenever you put those three together, the look of the colors and fonts, how you're represented visually, the tone of the words that you use and the way that you talk about your business, 
and also the feel, which is what the customer experiences when they interact with you. When you put all of those together, that makes up your branding. This is how you want to represent yourself to the market and specifically to your customer. The key for good branding is to have branding that's true to you, that it looks like you, it feels like you, it sounds like you. One of the things that I love about the Business Boutique is that I've gotten to be a part of all of the branding decisions leading up to any new project we've launched. And so I get to participate and make sure that it looks like me, it feels like me, and it sounds like me. That's creating branding that's true to you. All of these elements of your branding are what you're going to use to put out the best marketing possible. That includes your social media. That includes the look and feel of your website, what colors you choose, what your logo looks like. This includes even how you would set up a booth at a craft fair or flea market or art show. Everything that you do will reflect the branding of your business. So it needs to be consistent. It needs to be intentional. And it needs to be true to who you are. A great place to start when you're trying to think about your branding is to think of a list of adjectives of your business. For example, is your business more luxury or necessity? Is it more formal or maybe more casual? Is it very elite or is it for the everyday person? As you start to create a list of adjectives for your business, it's amazing how easily the branding will come together because you start to look at your descriptions And then you can come up with choices that you make about branding, about what colors and what fonts and what images and what experiences would reflect those adjectives that you chose. For example, if you want to have a business that's very sophisticated and formal and elite, then you probably wouldn't use a lot of the words that I use in all of my marketing, which is, hey guys, I mean, come on. I mean, we can do this. You know what I'm saying? I'm very casual. I'm very everyday. And I like for people to feel like I'm very approachable. And so the language that I use is my natural personality, but it also reflects what branding I want to put out there. So when you create this list of adjectives, it's going to help you think about and make choices for every element of the branding that you want to put out. As you think about who you are and what you want your business to represent, you also want to think about what makes you unique. What makes you stand out in the marketplace and why should someone buy from you versus the competition? I'll give you an example. There may be several things that make you unique, but I will challenge you. It's best to pick one thing that you want to lead with in all of your marketing. This would be called your unique position. This is the thing that you want to stand out among the competition and attract people to your business. Now, I will tell you, your unique position is not necessarily the only thing you do well. You may do a lot of things well, but you want to choose one thing to lead with to really put out there and leverage in your marketing. Your unique position also isn't necessarily something that no one else is doing. There may be a lot of people doing that thing well, but you just chose to leverage it in your marketing. Here's an example. Let's say that you run a coffee shop and you decide that what you want to leverage as your unique position with your coffee shop is that you have really fast service. So you might create a tagline or advertisement that says something like this. We'll get you your coffee in less time than it takes for the light to turn to green. So what you're doing when you're creating that tagline is you're saying, I'm going to solve your problem of being worried that you're not going to get to work in time. So anyone sitting in traffic that's thinking, man, I wish I had a good cup of coffee, you're relieving their fears about being late and telling them you can meet their need that they want good coffee. In that scenario, your unique position would be fast service. You're choosing to put out that you are fast at delivering service to your customers. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't also have good coffee, and it doesn't mean that no one else has fast service. You've just chosen to make that your unique position to stand out in the marketplace. Now, there may be another coffee shop just down the street, and they decide to have a different unique position. This coffee shop's position is that they have really good quality coffee. So they might have a tagline that says something like, don't drink the watered-down translucent coffee in the break room at work. Come on in for fresh French roast, hand-poured Colombian coffee. So in that example, they're relieving their customers' fears of, oh man, I really want a good cup of coffee and I don't want to drink the bad break room coffee. And they're telling them they have good quality coffee. That's not to say they're not also fast. That's also not to say that other coffee shops in town don't have good quality coffee. That's just what they've chosen to use as their unique position. So think through that for your business. 
As you think about who you are and what you want your business to represent, you can think about your branding and how you want it to look and how you want it to feel and how you want it to sound, but you also can think about what makes you unique. Why should someone buy from you versus the competition? And don't feel pressure that it has to be the only thing you do well. It doesn't. And don't feel pressure that no one else can be doing that thing because they can. You just make an intentional decision to pick something you're really good at in your business and leverage that that you're going to lead with it in your marketing. That's your unique position to stand out among the competition and attract people to buy from you. Okay, so marketing is a two-way street. It's a conversation between you and the market. So you know who you are. And you've thought about your branding and how you want it to look and what colors you want to use and what fonts you want to use. You've thought about how you want it to sound. What words will you use to represent your business? And even how you want it to feel. What type of experience do you want to create for your customers that they remember you by? You've also thought about what makes you unique. What do you want to leverage as your unique angle in all of your marketing to stand out among the competition? Now that you know who you are and how you want to represent yourself to the customer, The second thing you need to know is who your customer is. This would be your target market. First of all, there are a couple things I want you to know. Your target market is not everyone. You're not selling to anyone anywhere, even though I know in business it's tempting to do that, especially when you're just getting started out. You're just trying to make sales. But the truth is, for you to have effective marketing, you're not talking to everyone everywhere because you would end up reaching no one very well. So instead, you want to reach a specific type of person. This is your target audience. It's a specific type of person that wants what you have to offer and they're willing to pay the price you charge. Here's what's so great about this. When you start to talk to people that want what you have to offer and they're willing to pay your price, y'all, the sales become natural. You don't have to convince them or try to twist their arm because they already want what you have and they're willing to pay that price. So all you have to do is communicate the value to the right people in the right way. That's your target market. So let's talk about how to find them. One way that you can find your target market, and this is great if you're just starting out and you don't have a customer base, is you can just dream up your ideal customer. Think about someone that not only wants what you have to offer and is willing to pay the price you charge, but what else do you know about them? What type of mindset do they have? What type of thoughts or feelings or beliefs do they have that they need your business or they need your product or your service? What type of schedule do they have? What type of family life do they have? How do they feel in certain situations? I'll give you an example. I worked with a woman one time that she made custom miniature cake banners. They're these cute little banners that have different messages on them. Congratulations on your new baby or happy birthday, Sue, or whatever you want it to say. But they're tiny and they're held together by two sticks and you place them in a cake for a customized decoration. They're $15 a piece. So as I sat with this woman and dreamed up her ideal customer, we identified it's probably a woman that's a mom that has parties for her kids or hosts showers for her girlfriends. She probably cares what her friends think. That's why she would buy a cake banner for something customized and different. She probably doesn't have the time or desire to make something like that herself. And she's willing to pay $15 for a tiny miniature decoration. You can even name this person. We named this person Angela. So in our scenario, Angela was the ideal customer. She was a busy mom. She cared what her friends thought. She wanted to throw cute showers and parties for her kids and her friends' kids. And as a result, she would love something like a small customized cake banner for her cake. She's not going to buy her cake at Publix or Costco or Kroger. She wants something different and unique. So that, in this scenario, is the ideal customer. But what's yours? Who is your ideal customer? How do they think? How do they feel? What do they need? Why can your business serve or help them in some way? You can even write out a description of this person. You can give them a name. As you start to get to know them, and I mean really get to know them, what's amazing is marketing to them becomes so much easier because you know who you're talking to. You're not talking to everyone everywhere. You're talking to Angela. So all of your marketing copy on your website, all of your brochures, all of your social media posts, you're talking to Angela. And connecting with the right person in the right way becomes effortless. Now, if you've been in business for a little bit longer, you can actually ask your current customer base different qualities about them. You can do a quick survey. You can offer them a $5 gift card to Starbucks or maybe $10 off their next order with you. Now, if you've been in business for a while, the second thing that you can do is you can actually survey your current customer base. 
That's where you can ask your current customers some basic questions about themselves that will help you understand who your target audience is. You can ask them questions about what they like about your product or what are some problems that they need help with. What would they change to make that product or service better? You can always incentivize them taking the survey by a $5 gift card to Starbucks or $10 off their next order. You'd be amazed at how many people are willing to give their opinion. I mean, let's be honest. People like to talk about what they think, right? Just because you ask. And you can do a simple email form. You could use a program like SurveyMonkey. But you just put together a few questions, asking them about their thoughts and feelings and needs. And then you'll gain incredible insight into your target market because those are people currently buying from you. And it will help you understand them so you can sell to more people like them. So those are the basics of tier number four, which is putting yourself out there through marketing. You need to know who you are, and that's branding and what makes you unique. And you need to know who your customer is, and that's your target market. That's who you're trying to talk to. When you get those two things right, you're able to talk to the right person in the right way. And that is when you'll see your marketing not only take off, but you'll see your business grow as well. Okay, now just like last time, let's stop and recap what we've covered. Last episode, we talked about tiers one and two of your business plan. If you missed that, go back and listen to it. You need all aspects of this plan in order to make your business successful. Now, we've just talked about tiers three and four. Tier three of your business plan is where you get operational, and that's where you want to figure out what the logistics, platform, and policies are for your business. Tier four of your business plan is where you put yourself out there through marketing, and you want to think about your branding and your target market. Well, we've just covered a few basics about branding, but I'm excited because today we have a branding expert with us to dive into this more. My good friend and New York Times bestselling author, Donald Miller is here, and he's going to share some advice for us on how to create a clear message with your brand using story. Donald, thanks for being here. My pleasure. So one of the things that I know you teach a lot is this whole idea of story brand. And I understand branding, and a lot of the women that I work with know that branding is important in their business. But tell me the difference between branding and what you're talking about with story brand. Most business leaders, I'm convinced, most people who start a business, small business, big business, doesn't matter, spend way too much money on their website, put way too much effort into how things look. They do all this stuff, and it just doesn't work. It doesn't get a return on their investment. And the reason is it isn't clear. The main tool that we can use to sell products or grow our business is to communicate very clearly. And we need to communicate what we sell, why it will make our customers' lives better, and what they need to do to buy it. If I can't go to your website and in five seconds know what you offer, how it's going to make my life better, and what I need to do to buy it, you're losing sales. That's the pertinent information. So we tend to go on our website and we want to say, well, you know, our grandfather started the company, our grandmother started the company, or we got started in 1987. (laughs) Nobody cares about that. Right. They really only care about how you're going to make my life better. And companies that can stay very disciplined and keep their communication about the customer rather than the brand itself, are going to win in the marketplace. Well, I think that's such a struggle, too, because so many of us, especially in business, we're so excited about our idea. We're so excited about our business, and we just want everyone to be as excited as we are. But the truth is, your customers aren't. They're not as excited as you are, and most of them don't know what you can do for them. And it's like you and I have talked about before, where many of your customers are asking the question, why do I care? And so the message should answer those questions for them. But the problem that I've seen with a lot of women that I work with is we answer those questions, or we think we're answering those questions with a lot of words, a lot (laughs) of words. And you talk about cutting those back to just the most concise, important information. So talk to us about how to do that. I don't know how many clients have come through StoryBrand now and have cut 50% or more of the words off of their website Mm -hmm. and saw a massive uptick in engagement. Wow. Because the human brain is trying to do two things. The first thing that the human brain is tasked with, your brain, my brain, everybody's brain, is to keep us alive. It's to help us survive and thrive. So you are always scanning your environment for, if you're hungry, you're looking for food, water. Once that's taken care of, it's shelter. Once that's taken care of, it's relationships. And relationships are all about building a tribe that will defend us against a threat. That's why we're doing that. So at the subconscious level, your brain is constantly scanning the environment for that information. Therefore... If you position your product as something that will help somebody survive and thrive, which is a massive array of ideas, right? right? I mean, it could be fashion, which will help me be more attractive and like myself more, which will help me build a better tribe. All that stuff is related to surviving and thriving. It's why we like it. Uh, But if we can't figure out how you're helping me survive and thrive, 
I am programmed. I'm literally designed to tune you out. Mm. And here's why. It's because the second thing that the human brain is trying to do, and it's trying to conserve calories. So it takes calories for me to scan my environment and try to survive <laughs> and thrive. This and sounds if, so weird. <laughs> it, it does, doesn't it? That's why when you walk into a giant room, you don't know or care how many chairs there are in the room, but you know where the exits are. Mm. What happened in your subconscious is your subconscious said, I don't need the information about the chairs. I need the information about the exits in case there's a fire. Mm. And it's constantly catching categorizing that information. Most businesses position themselves as the chairs and not the exits. Oh, wow. In other words, they communicate information that nobody needs. The brain is designed to filter out that information and move on and try to find information that will help them survive and thrive. So therefore, when I go to your website, I've got to know what do you offer? How's it going to make my life better? And what do I need to do to buy it? It's the pertinent information. What we're really doing is we're editing content for our customers so that they don't have to edit themselves. Mm. Human beings are not drawn to the best products and services. I know it sounds crazy. We don't buy the best phones, the best computers, the best coats, the best right. jewelry. We don't buy it. Right. We buy the products and services that are communicated in such a way that we can associate them with our survival. Mm. That's what we buy. And the more we understand that, the more clearly we can communicate in such a way that people will go, oh, wait, I'm interested. Can you tell me more? When somebody says, I'm interested, can you tell me more? You've locked into their survival mechanism. You talk about how sometimes that's actually done by saying less words than more. Often it's done by saying less <laughs> words. And you talk about, too, how when you give someone an idea, when you communicate an idea on your website, they're having to work to think about it. And you use this treadmill example. So yeah. give that example because I love that visual. Well, well and whenever you're trying to pitch somebody or explain what it is that you offer, they're having to burn these calories, right? So the best way to filter your message is to imagine them having to run on a treadmill. As soon as you start talking about your company and what you sell on Etsy or whatever, imagine them on a treadmill. How long <laughs> do you think they're going to last? Depends on how in shape they are, but right. probably not super long. Then every idea that you share with them. My grandfather started the company, or we only use these kinds of materials or whatever, mm -hmm. all that useless information that nobody really needs. <laughs> You're handing them a bowling ball while they're running on the treadmill. <laughs> How many bowling balls do you think they can handle? Probably three. Once you hand them the fourth, they'll drop all of those bowling balls, and they'll literally walk away. So we have to, one, communicate in such a way where they don't have to burn very many calories to understand what we're talking about, and also not bombard them with complicated, big ideas that are causing them to hold too many bowling balls. We will sell more product if you just go into a room and say, I sell this product because people struggle with this problem and it makes them feel this way. But after they use my product, they feel so much better. It's 1995, and you can get it at this website. Just say that. That's simple. And you're out. Well, I love how you explain it, too, because the visual of the treadmill just makes me think of, okay, every time I'm talking about my idea, I'm making the customer work. And when mm -hmm. you start to look at it through that lens, instead of, oh, I'm really helping them by giving them this 47-page document with all the details of features and benefits of my business, instead you're making them work, yep. then it makes you right, It makes you think about it differently, and you think, I don't want to make them work hard. I no. want to make it easy on the them to buy. Them. Do the work for them. There's a race to get your product to market. There's also a race to communicate it clearly. The three Ps of business have traditionally been people. you got to get your people right if you want to run a successful business. Your people have to be right. They're the most important. And I'm talking about employees and team right. members, right? Your people have to be right. Then you got to dial in your product. Make sure it's perfect. And then if your product starts to take off, you're going to have to create processes to manufacture those products and distribute those products. People, product, process. That's where most businesses stop. Mm -hmm. And that's enough to help you break even every year and maybe make a little bit of money. The businesses that explode figured out the fourth P, and the fourth P is positioning. Mm. If you have positioned yourself in the product well, you'll take off. When Apple repositioned themselves in the marketplace, they went from bankruptcy, court, you know, basically, to the largest corporation in the world. When politicians position themselves in the marketplace as the guide for the hero public, they go off the charts in polls and numbers. Positioning really matters. Do people know why your product helps them survive and thrive? Have they made that connection? If they haven't made that connection, we have to clarify it for them so that they don't have to think about it. You talk, too, about this relationship with your customer where you want to be clear and it needs to answer those three questions anytime they go to your website or read anything from your company. But there's also a relational component with your customers where I think a lot of businesses get it backwards. And you talk about this relationship between the hero and the guide. And most people in business think, well, I'm the hero. Of course, I'm solving their problem. I would be the person I should talk about. Let me talk about me, me, me. Right, right. Let's talk about me. Because you think you have to get 
get your story out there. Right. You don't. As if they care. But instead, you kind of flip that. So talk about that relationship with the hero and the guide and what you mean by that. Well, in stories, there are roles. There are characters in stories. There are four or five of them. But the two most important are the hero, who the story is really about, Luke Skywalker and Katniss and all that kind of stuff. And then there's the guide. And the guide would be Haymitch or Yoda, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Those are the guys. We recommend at StoryBrand that you position your brand as the guide and you position your customer as the hero. In other words, the communication is always about the customer. We think customers want to know our story and we have to introduce ourselves. I firmly believe that's a waste of time and money. What you really want to do is when the customer begins to engage your branding material, they find their own story. Mm. These people are like me. They want the same things I like. They want the same things I want. They have to overcome the same challenges that I have to overcome. They empathize with me and understand my journey and don't talk about themselves so much. They actually talk about the problem that I'm suffering with and how they can help me resolve it. They give me a plan to resolve that problem. And they help me envision a climactic scene in which my problem would go away. I just described every movie you've ever seen from Tommy (laughs) Boy to Bridget Jones. And the reason those movies work so well is because that's the story everybody's living. So if I wake up self-identifying as the hero in a story, and then I encounter you and you talk about your brand and what your revenue goals are and all this kind of stuff, here's what happens. Subconsciously, I say, I'm a hero in a story. You're a hero in a story. I wish you the best. Let me know how it goes. But step aside. I'm looking for a guide. To position ourselves as a guide, we want to have two things. Empathy with our customers' problems, especially their internal frustration. The only reason anybody's calling you is because they're frustrated. They have a problem. They're scared or they're worried or something. They're Mm -hmm. calling you because they want you to help them solve a problem. Mm -hmm. We have to voice that we care about that problem, empathy. And the next is authority. And by authority, I really mean competence. Mm -hmm. We have to have the competence to be able to help them solve their problem. So the reason business boutique is a business, I'm convinced, the reason that it works, among a lot of other things, is because, one, you've identified a problem that people actually have. You are very empathetic and caring about that problem. And in terms of solving that problem, you know what you're doing, right? Your speakers and you. You and your curriculum have solved this problem for thousands of people. That's the one-two punch of positioning yourself as a guide. Well, and it's interesting, too, because I think we've talked about this before with the copy used on your website and it getting a lot of words. But so often we focus on the features of our business rather than the benefit to the customer. Right. And so I try to talk to women about this when we're crafting an elevator pitch, for example. But it plays into this idea of this hero-guide relationship. Are you talking about the customer or are you talking about right. yourself? Right. And so, for example, the business boutique, it would be very easy for some someone to say, okay, Christy, what is the business boutique? Tell me what that does. And I say, oh, well, we have a podcast and we have events and we have a book coming out in April, which I'm <laughs> so excited a about. Of we ideas, have, we yeah. have coaching and we just have blogs. It's so fantastic. And all I've done is talk about myself and the business boutique. But instead, our tagline for the business boutique is equipping women to make money doing what they love. Mm. And so it's all about what we're going to do for you. And we understand that you probably have something you love and you want to make money at it. And it covers those two pain points for them. And so it's so interesting because whether it's a 140 character tweet or it's a long explanation on your website, the whole idea is what you're saying is you're always setting the customer up to be the hero and you're talking about what's in it for them. That's exactly it. And what we're really talking about with an elevator pitch, we call it a one-liner. And in the movie business, it's called a one-liner. You need to create a one-liner about the movie because when people are scanning their iPhones, figuring out what movie they want to go to tonight, they need to read something that is enticing. It can't be more than a couple sentences. And a business needs the same thing. So anybody listening to me who runs a business or works for a business, you need a one-liner that explains what your business is about. You have a great one. Three great components for one-liner. One is a problem. Second is a plan. And third is the resolution of the problem. So at StoryBrand, when somebody says, what does StoryBrand do? Most business leaders struggle to talk about what they offer. We have a seven-part framework that allows them to clarify their communication so more people buy. That's it. Now, I'm going to get a bunch more business cards in an elevator saying that than I will saying, as you mentioned earlier, well, I got a workshop and then I'm yeah. trying to write a book and it's yeah. a, you know we deal with a lot of companies. You know, that doesn't describe yeah. anything. A problem, what's the problem that your customer has? What's your plan to help them? And then what does life look like if they go through this process? Those three things in one sentence 
write it on an index card, memorize it, tattoo it on your inside of your eyelids, whatever you need to do, right. and that's what we say. And you'll find that just like in a log line or a one-liner for a movie, people go, I want to know more about that. And they show up at the theater and buy some popcorn and watch the rest of the movie unfold. Well, and so often I think a lot of the businesses I work with, many people are not communicating in this way because they don't know it themselves. And so I love that you walk through, like you said, a seven-part process that tells them how to clarify it. Because most of the business women I work with, I'll be honest, are like everyone in business and they're just putting out fires. They're just trying to keep up with the day-to-day. They don't have any time to work on the business. They're always working in the business. They're behind the computer, behind the sewing machine, whatever that thing is for them. And so this is such an important message for you all listening to step out of your business, get out of the weeds for a minute and work on it so that you can increase your sales, you can clarify your message, and you're able to reach your goals that you're talking about because it's not going to happen accidentally. All of this takes, you know, intentionality in just some planning. So I know that you're going to cover this at the event and we're going to talk about the seven steps, but I would love it if you would just give us that quick flyover of what are those seven steps that are the components to a great story that you use as the background for this. Okay, well, I'm going to ruin movies for you forever, (laughs) but here it goes. Uh, Every great movie, every great story is about a character that has a problem who meets a guide that gives them a plan and calls them to action that either ends in a success or a failure. That's every single movie you can think of. Now, if those are the seven elements, plot lines of a movie that work, that means the human brain is designed to engage. It's like a song. It's like music instead of noise. There's a formula to it. So what we need to define are seven questions. What does our character want? What does our hero customer want? What are their problems in getting what they want? Have we positioned ourselves as a guide? Are we providing a plan for them that gives them hope that they can win the day? Are we calling them to action, meaning are we asking them to buy something? We have to do that. Have we clearly identified how their life will be better if they buy our product? And have we also said how life will be worse if they don't? What are the tragic consequences that we are helping them avoid? Without those seven elements in your brand narrative, people will lose interest. That is the way they are hardwired. Everybody is categorizing information into those seven elements all day long. If you give them those seven elements and you don't give them anything else, they don't have to do the work to categorize it and they go crazy about your brand. It's such a simple idea, but I love it too because one of the things that many of the women I work with struggle with is selling and talking about their product or service. They don't want to be pushy. We've talked about this before, (laughs) but when you're giving them a framework of story, it's like, man, anyone can tell a story. Anyone can engage in that type of conversation and then you're going to be equipped to talk about your business in a way that not only are you confident in that works, but it's also fun. You're not ashamed to talk about your business because it's something you understand and it's easy to talk about with that And the great thing is it takes a couple days. Folks come to our workshops. They spend two days figuring out their brand narrative. Then they do a little bit of hard work putting it up on their website. And then they walk away and all of a sudden everybody falls in love with the brand because all these tools that we've created are out there communicating for us. We can go back to putting out fires, but now we have material that's making the word spread. So it's just super important to get this right. Well, I think it's such an important message. And I know you've seen the impact in businesses that you've worked with, thousands of businesses. But I'm so excited to see what it's going to do at the Business Boutique in November because these women are so fired up about their business. You're going to have a blast on stage. And just being in that room of women is really inspiring the amazing ideas that they have. And they're so creative and they're so innovative. And you're going to give them the tools they need to be able to talk about those things so that the marketplace can see what they have to offer. So I'm so looking forward to that. And Donald, thanks for taking some time with us today to give us some tips that we can apply to our business. But I'm really looking forward to November and we'll see you then. Me too. My pleasure. Now, if you guys want to know more about building your brand, come to the Business Boutique event in Nashville this November. Donald Miller is going to be there talking about how to tell your story to better connect your audience with your brand. And we have a special code just for you, the Business Boutique podcast listeners. Use the code BBWrite at businessboutique.com and you'll receive $10 off any ticket to the Business Boutique event. That's B-B-W-R-I-G-H-T. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I love a good inspirational story of someone that's actually doing this. I love seeing real women out there on the front lines winning in business. And I'm very lucky to have a friend with me today that's doing just that. Melissa Henna is founder of Grace and Lace. She's also one of the top five most successful businesses from Shark Tank. And I'm excited because she's here with us today to share with us a little bit about her experience of working a plan and building her business. 
Melissa, thanks so much for hanging out with us today. Thanks, Christy. Melissa, I have loved hearing and learning about your story of the growth of Grace and Lace. And most people know you as this Shark Tank success story, which is certainly true. But as we know, it didn't start there and it didn't happen overnight. So I would love it if you would just kind of start at the beginning for our listeners and take them back to how you got the idea to start Grace and Lace in the first place. Yeah, you know, Christy, I've always wanted to be a stay-at-home mom, but I've had this kind of inside me that I maybe wanted a side business. I wanted to kind of use my brain outside of baby talk with my kids. And, you know, I always desired to have a business. I didn't know what it was. And I kind of called Grace and Lace my accidental company because I didn't start out to start a business. It actually kind of, in terms of accidental, kind of came out of a tragedy for us. I was halfway through pregnancy with our little girl and at a routine doctor's visit. And my doctor came into the room and suddenly told me, Melissa, you're going to give birth to your daughter and she's not going to survive. And it was just really, really impactful for us in terms of our life turning upside down at that point. They rushed me in emergency surgery, and the doctor said, we're going to do our best to save her and to save the pregnancy, but you'll remain in the hospital for potentially four months, the duration of the pregnancy. And, you know, laying on my back there in the hospital, I had to do something, and I worked with my hands. I had learned to crochet and knit, and my love for knits and creating was developed there in that hospital bed while I was working to keep this baby in. And unfortunately, a couple of weeks after being in the hospital, the doctors could no longer stop the labor in our little girl was born a um, little too early to survive. So we went through a very, very, very hard time losing her. My love for knits continued to develop and grow through that time, and I really got a lot of healing. The Lord was really through knitting and working with my hands. And one day I was inspired. I want to make a pair of boot socks that have cute little lace and buttons sticking out of the top of them, and I need to figure out a way to make these. I was so frustrated sewing, knitting, Trying to make this pair of socks took me five hours in the sewing machine and finally made them. And I came down with them. I told my husband, I'm never going to make another pair again. This took me so long. (laughs) I'm done. Not going to make another pair. But they took me so long. I had to wear them. Everywhere I went, people loved them. Strangers would come up and ask me, can we make a pair for me? Oh, my gosh, you made those. Can I make a pair for me? Here's my number. And very quickly, my husband, being an entrepreneur, said, you might have a business on your hands making these things. I'm like, I don't want to make anymore. They took me five hours to make. <laughs> Famous and, last words. <laughs> right, right. And he's like, remember, we never say never about these kind of things. <laughs> and he's like, why don't you just put them up online and see, you know, put them up on Facebook, see what your friends think about them. And I did and just had this massive response. Within three days, we had over 400 requests for this pair of socks with lace. And so, you know, very quickly, this hobby, what was a little do-it-yourself pair of socks, was turning quickly into a business. That's incredible, too, to just realize how quickly that caught on when you created something that other people wanted. And it was very unique. This was before boot socks were super, super popular. And it just caught on so fast. And so I know for you, it was a surprise in the beginning. But what I love about your story is that you were able to keep up with that demand, even though you said, this took me five hours. I'm never making these socks again. Mm -hmm. And then once you realized the opportunity to not only serve and help more people, but do what you'd said, maybe stay home and Mm -hmm. have options to create a side business, you really were able to keep up with it. And so tell me from that point when you realized, oh, wow, this is a thing. This is catching on. What did you do next? How did you actually turn that into something a little bit more official like a business? Right. You know, it would have been so easy for me to tell all 400 people, oh, I'm sorry. It took me five hours to make. I'm not making another (laughs) No, thank you. But (laughs) that's not ingrained inside of me. And there was that entrepreneurial spirit that came out of like, oh my gosh, we're going to find a way to make these. And my husband's like, okay, you spent hours doing it. You obviously know how to make the pattern and you can train other people to do it. And light bulbs were going off and I was like, oh my gosh. And, you know, I had friends that sewed and he's like, your friends, why don't we hire them? And I'm like, well, they have babies. And he's like, well, you can do it while they're napping. And they're like, oh my gosh, they'd love to have something to do, you know, on the side producing an income as well. And so I hired my friends. I hired my stay-at-home mom friends that had time to sew and make these. And we developed this little operation. And I think it was key that we only grew as fast as we needed to grow. We didn't jump ahead. I didn't say, oh, we need to buy an office space. We need to hook up phone lines. We need to get a website up. Like We only took baby steps as long as demand needed it. And I think so many people, I think that could be a mistake. And a lot of people, they try to develop this business so quick right away. We really just follow those steps along the path to provide the product to the customer. And so I hired my neighbors, hired my friends, taught them how to sew, and we developed this little system. They made them. I sold them. I pre-sold them. They made them. And we had a little system going. I love that advice of growing slow because that is the number two reason that businesses fail is they try to grow too quickly and they don't have the infrastructure to support it. And so in your example, you really did grow as you were able to. And there's a little bit of element of scrappiness too, right? Like in the beginning, you're making it up as you go. You're like, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to do it. We're going to serve these 400 people and we're 
going to grow this into something, yeah. even though it's messy and imperfect, and I'm hiring my neighbors or anybody that's willing to help that'll learn how to sew. So there's this scrappiness, but also there was an intentionality yes. to it at the same time of taking your time, saying yes at the right time, saying no at the right time, and being wise with the growth and what the business could actually support and what you could support, what you guys could handle at the time. So I love that wisdom. Now, this is obviously blown up since then, and those 400 orders seem tiny compared to where the business <laughs> is now. So take me through some of those next layers of success and next layers of growth and scale, and what are some things you did, and how did you keep up with that? You know, Christy, actually, kind of going back a little bit, my husband and I, when we first got married, we were actually $80,000 in personal debt, and we actually through Dave Ramsey's trainings and teachings and envelope system, we ground our way out and we were determined we're getting out of debt and we're never going to get in debt again. We're never going to owe anything to anyone ever again. And so when this business started, typically people have the mindset of, oh, I need to take out a loan. I need to go to the bank. I need to get money up front in order to build this business. And we didn't want to do that. And we didn't have the money to do that. And so how I did it is I pre-sold product in advance. So I collected people's money for the product. I took a picture selfie of them on my legs, put it up online, sold it as the picture, collected their money, used the money to buy the supplies to make their item and then get them their item. And you know, now we're a multi-million dollar company and I still pre-sell items to make sure that we're going to be in a good financial position to pay for the product that we're making. Even when I went on to hiring and needing to hire people, I made sure that the cost of the product that I was selling paid for that individual right out of that cost of the product. When I hired Grace, she was doing my shipping. She got paid per item that she shipped. So it covered my butt, I guess, in terms of I don't need to overcommit myself and overextend myself where I don't know that I can pay her in the beginning of this business. Well, and I think too, for you guys, like you experienced this incredible growth even before you went on Shark Tank, yes. which a lot of people probably don't know. So talk a little bit about what level you were at even before you ever went on the show. I launched the first selfie up online October 31st, four and a half years ago. And within two months, we had already done $60,000 in sales, which was phenomenal for something that was absolutely accidental, you know, right. in, in terms. <laughs> and we got contacted right away by some big buyers. I got an email two weeks into this business from Nordstrom Buyer and said, can you make 50,000 pairs of these socks? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm hardly making one. And I've yeah. got all my neighbors working for me that we make 30 a day and can't even keep up fast enough. You know, there's no way I can make 50,000, but I don't want to turn it down. I said, you know what? I bet there's a way we can find to get into manufacturing. We can scale as fast as we need to. And we put that on hold and we were were able to produce that a couple years down the road for them. And within a year of being in business, we had done $800,000 in sales our oh first year gosh. in business. That is incredible. Yeah. So as you've experienced this unbelievable growth, you talked a little bit about building this business debt-free, which yes. is just such an inspirational story. I think so many people think business loans are just a part of business and you can't have a business without a loan. And your example is just such a testimony. The fact that if you grow slow and you're wise with it, you really can completely maintain control of your business and all the decisions you make by never taking out debt. Yeah. And that's one of the many ways that you've stayed true to yourself. But tell me, what are some other ways that you've been able to build this massive multi-million dollar business that's still true to you? Even though it's scaled way beyond anything you thought, it still reflects who you are and your personal passions and values, even at this level. And that's a great question, Christy, because at this level, it'd be so easy for me just to hire big people, give them big names, pay them big salaries, pay them big incomes. And to me, it's important that even though we've gone so big, I want to stay small in terms I want to still have the connection with the customer. I still want to develop and create products that I like, that I know that they're going to like. I want to know that I'm designing a product that I love to wear because they're going to love to wear it. And so it's important really to keep that heart of how the business started still in place, even though we are this big company now. It would be so easy to turn turn into just a brand name. And I don't want it to be that way. I want it to still feel like an at-home business that it was. We were operating on my garage for almost three years. And your business will become what you want it to become. And for me, it's just been important to keep it small, even though it's grown so big. That's such a good piece of advice. And Melissa, your whole story is just so inspirational of how you have this victory over something that was so difficult in your life and how God has taken something and turned it into something, not only that's a blessing to your family and redemption for your story, but also just such a blessing to so many people. So I would love it if, as we wrap up, you would just end with maybe a few words of encouragement for women that are in those beginning stages and they're scared, or maybe they have, you know, a major setback in their life, like something you experienced that was just such a tragedy that really impacted you forever. Speak to them, give them some words of encouragement as they try to take their dream and make it happen. It's so important to understand, and a lot of people have probably heard a lot of your teachings, Christy, and I think understanding that why and fully locking in, why is it that I'm doing this business? Why is it that I'm creating? 
buying this product. I mean, for some people, it's to support their family, to have a side income. For me, my heart was really stirred as a teenager. When I was 19, I spent my summer in India working in orphanages in the poorest of poor Mother Teresa homes in northern India. And for me, I left a note in my journal that summer. I've got to do something more. I've never seen kids, bellies so extended, so malnourished, no one to hug and love on them that I knew I needed to make a difference. Little did I know as a 19-year-old that one day God would give me a business that would be able to fund the building of orphanages. Wow. And to me, that's my why. I have that picture that I look at these kids that reminds me, this is why I have to price products the way I price them. This is why I keep designing. This is why I keep doing things. And I think no matter what your why is, there's no small whys. Some may be intimidated. I can't build orphanages or I can't, you know, it doesn't matter. What your why is, is your why. And that's what needs to keep you going and keep you motivated to keep going. I love it. I can't think of a more powerful way to end on it. Melissa, thank you so much for sharing this with our listeners. I know that your story is such an inspiration to them and it kind of gives them that extra boost of energy that they can keep going by looking at someone like you. So thanks for taking time with us. Now, you may remember from the last episode where we talked about Amber Jones as an amazing success story, but I want you to hear the story of another woman, just like you, who had a dream and she turned it into a thriving business. I had no idea what I was doing at all. I learned everything I know about business from Dave Ramsey and Shark Tank. This is Megan Hardwick, owner and inventor of Wings Cosmetics. My name is Megan Hardwick. I'm the owner and inventor of Wings Cosmetics. Almost a year ago to date, I had this insane idea that I wanted to create a product out of necessity because I was feeling pretty run down and I wasn't doing my makeup, I wasn't getting ready, and it was really starting to affect me as a mom and you know my self-esteem. And so I had this crazy idea that I wanted to do my makeup really fancy, you know, like you see all these professionals do it. And I was scrolling through my phone and I was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to do that because I have two boys. You know, I can't even put dishes away without somebody tugging on me. So I thought, surely there's something to help me put my eyeliner on. And there wasn't anything. So I kept thinking about it and kept thinking about it. And I thought, I need to create something that helps me get this look. And I started drawing, and pretty soon I came up with this product that puts your eyeliner on for you in this trend that you see. As a fan of Dave Ramsey and follower of The Baby Steps, Megan didn't want to go into debt to start her business. We followed Dave Ramsey. I didn't want to use any of my husband and I's savings in case it didn't work, and I didn't have an extra $16,000 sitting around to do a manufacturing tool. So that was a big struggle. I didn't know how I was going to pay for it. But I believed in this enough and I could not shake it that I wanted to move forward with it. So I was willing to make that sacrifice. I sold everything. I sold my nice camera, a computer, a diamond ring, cleaned out my closets. You know, I did some extra work. And that's how I paid for the prototype, the first designs and all that stuff. And then when I launched it, I took pre-orders. And so I made it very clear that it's going to take this long for you to get your order. And then I paid for everything and then delivered the product. So I invested $15,000, but I gave up everything. My house is so empty and totally worth it. So the business is completely debt free. I don't have any debt on it. Megan has experienced unbelievable success. I launched in January. And three days after I launched, I went global. And I had no idea that could even happen. So I was getting orders from overseas. And then three weeks after that, I heard from the MTV Awards. I was invited to go showcase my product for a gifting suite. And I heard from CNBC. So it's been very successful in just a short amount of time. Megan has very specific and measurable goals for her business. At one point, she made $10,000 in one week. I have a very specific goal, you know, I make $20,000 each month and I'm on track to make that in my first year. (laughs) My next goal is to to find people that have the same values and goals and mission as I do to help, you know, other women that were struggling like me. It's not just always about making sales for me. It's about helping people, serving my customer. Success hasn't come easy. She's had real struggles along the way. I don't have a college degree. Like I said, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I just kept going and I kept reading and studying mentors and figured out what they were doing and kind of replicated it. But I didn't give up. And even though I had no idea what I was doing, I just kept going. I didn't know where to start, but I started somewhere and I kept going. There were critics along the way, but Megan chose not to focus on them. 90% of the people love my products because they're like me and they can't do their eyeliner this way. But then there's 10% of the people that can do it. And I got a lot of, not a lot of negative feedback, but a a good amount of negative feedback that it stuck out. (laughs) At first it was very difficult and I was very emotional because I'm like, I'm such a nice person. Like, why are these people being so mean to me? I just, I didn't get it. 
I had to realize that if I stuck on that, I wouldn't be where I was today because then I would get an email from somebody who was never able to get this look and they were struggling with self-confidence and I had to just go back to all those positive comments and all those positive stories that I was actually helping them. It wasn't just makeup to them. They were getting confidence back. So I blocked all the negative because if I'm constantly focusing on it, it's just going to bring me down. So out of sight, out of mind and focus on all the positive. A key ingredient to Megan's success was social media marketing. I've been studying Facebook marketing for about five years just because we had a prior business, you know, just a side hobby. And I've kind of figured out that you need to build a community. So I started doing that even before I launched my product. But what set it off, my product, there isn't one like it on the market right now. It is the first of its kind. And I did a video just in my bathroom for like a minute. My husband's like, you need to show how this works. There wasn't anything professional about it and it went viral. And so that's really what kicked it off. And then I just learned like what my customer was looking for. I really had to study and figure out how to write these Facebook ads, but not in a pushy way. So yeah, I've used Facebook to my advantage. When we talked to Megan, she had just attended the Business Boutique in Fort Worth, Texas, and was about to attend Entree Leadership Summit in Dallas, Texas. Even though Megan had been in business for over a year, when she came to the Business Boutique, she realized she had never thought about the why behind her business. I definitely had to figure out my why statement and really make that clear and present to me. In fact, after the first day, I went home and just reevaluated all of those initial steps that somebody in a brand new business is starting out. So my why statement was really important because you get a lot of negative people and you start to question that. You know, like, is this going to fail? Am I going to be able to keep going? Am I going to run out of customers? And that was probably my biggest thing is the why statement. It was huge for me. Megan's advice to others is to simply start somewhere. You can achieve your goals. People are like, I have an idea or I have a product. Where do you start? Where did you start? And they're spending too much time wondering where to start and you're going to miss it. Somebody else is going to do it if you spend so much time on that. Stop wondering where to start and just go somewhere. And if that's not the right spot, go to the next one. That's not the right one, go to the next one. Don't get held up if you hear the word no, because sometimes no is just a different opportunity. Even though I didn't have the degree or the previous knowledge, doesn't mean I can't do it. I just learn along the way. I honestly had no idea. I had no idea where it would go. I thought I'd sell a few online, you know maybe uh, help a few of my friends and other moms that were in my same position. I had no idea it would go this far. It's surreal sometimes. I wake up and I just think like, why did God put me in this position? Because, you know, I'm very unqualified. I'm not anything special, you know. It's so surreal. And I just think back about all the things that me and my husband have gone through and where I came from, because it was literally nothing. And, you know, I think sometimes people get that in their head that that's where they're supposed to be. That, you know, I was born here, you know, I'm poor in life and, you know, that's where I was just supposed to be. And uh, it's just crazy to think back about all the trekking that I did. And a year later, I have a very successful business and it's a blessing. During the past two episodes, we've heard stories from two women who both attended a business boutique live event. They were at different points in their businesses, but they learned tactical skills that they could apply to their business. Y'all, that can be you. We have a special discount code just for you, so you can receive $10 off any ticket to the Business Boutique event in Nashville this fall. Go to businessboutique.com and use the code BBRIGHT. That's B-B-W-R-I-G-H-T and receive $10 off any ticket to the Business Boutique. Don't miss this opportunity to learn how to make money doing what you love. I'll see you there. Now, this week's homework is to finish filling out the quick start guide that you started last episode by completing the final two tiers of the plan. If you haven't downloaded it yet, you can download the quick start guide in the show notes of this episode by going to businessboutique.com slash podcast. But don't stop there. I want you to take action and implement this plan in your business. We also have a special offer from Melissa Hennett specifically for you, the listeners of the Business Boutique podcast. Go to the show notes of this episode and you'll be able to access a code that will give you 15% off anything site-wide at graceandlace.com, which is Melissa Hennett's clothing company. Now, here's the best part. Y'all, there are no exclusions to this deal. You get 15% off anything from Grace and Lace. This code is only valid for 30 days and it ends on September 22nd, so don't wait. Now, one more thing before we go. I want to make sure that you don't miss out on one of the best benefits of the Business Boutique, which is connecting with other women like you. Go to businessboutique.com slash podcast. And in the comments to this episode, let me know how you're doing. Let me know how you're working in your strengths. Talk to other listeners, comment and get to know them. See if there are ways that you can help each other. 
I'm sure there are things that you're really good at that other people could benefit from, and there are other people that can help you as well. You'll be amazed at the energy and wisdom you'll gain from connecting with other women on the same journey you are. Now that's it for now. Thanks for hanging out with me as always, and don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. For more encouragement on how to make money doing what you love, visit businessboutique.com. Mercy Me is coming to Pittsburgh. The Together Again Tour with Mercy Me, Crowder, and special guest, Andrew Ripp. Thursday, October 5th. Bring your family and friends to the PPG Pain Serena in Pittsburgh for Mercy Me, Crowder, and Andrew Ripp live in concert. Three multiple award-winning artists on one stage for one night. Let your spirit soar, your heart sing, and your faith ignite. Mark your calendars for Thursday, October 5th. Get your tickets now at mercyme.org.